All right, if you have your Bibles, would you open to Zechariah chapter 7? We're going to be going through chapters 7 and 8 this morning. And as you're doing that, ask yourself this. Have you ever wondered what God thinks about your worship? How do I know whether my worship is actually acceptable to God? What should I be aiming for when I walk through those doors that say Grace Bible Church in the morning? For the last six chapters, God has given Judah this fantastic picture of the future, and he's given it to them in eight visions. And they're very, very, very encouraging to those who return from Babylon. And these are pretty godly people. They left Babylon and all of its worldliness, and they chose the hard life of rebuilding the temple back in Jerusalem. But God actually has a message for them, and it's a surprising message. And it has to do with the genuineness of their worship. And this is very helpful to us because the same principles that God gives to them apply to us in our worship as well. So what we're going to do today is we're going to look at four different things. We're going to be looking at the characteristics of ritual worship. And then we're going to look at the characteristics of true worship. And then we're going to look at the consequences of ritual worship. And then God is going to give us in chapter 8 a picture of perfect worship. So let's spend some time in chapter 7, looking at verses 1 through 7. We're going to be looking at the characteristics of ritual worship. And it's good for us to remember here when we get started that the, the story started in Zechariah chapter 1 in the second year of King Darius. And we know from Ezra chapter 6 that the work was completed in the sixth year, the work of rebuilding the temple in the sixth year of Darius. And so when we read here in the fourth year, we can gather that they're about halfway through the rebuilding of the temple. So keep that in mind as we read uh, the first couple of verses. Now it happened in the fourth year of King Darius, the word of Yahweh came to Zechariah on the fourth day of the ninth month, which is Chislev. And the town of Bethel sent Sharazer and Regemelech and their men to entreat the favor of Yahweh, speaking to the priests who belonged to the house of Yahweh, of hosts, and to the prophets, saying, Shall I weep in the fifth month and abstain as I have done these many years? So the city of Bethel has sent these men to the priests, and he sent them to entreat the favor of Yahweh. And on the surface, entreating the favor of Yahweh seems like a good thing to do. Let's entreat the favor of Yahweh. And you notice in verse 3 that they're speaking to the priests, they're speaking to the right audience as they do this. They're speaking to the priests and the prophets. They're seeking their counsel from a really good source. So all of this looks really good. They want to entreat favor. They're coming to the right people for that. Notice their question. Their question is in verse 3. Shall I weep in the fifth month and abstain? So the question has to do with mourning and fasting. Well, they point to the fifth month because it is in the fifth month that Nebuchadnezzar came to Jerusalem and he burned the temple. That's recorded for us in 2 Kings chapter 25. And what Israel did was they instituted a period of mourning and fasting for those 70 years while they were in Babylon to commemorate this. And the question that they have here is, should we continue with this? And it's a reasonable question because now we're back. We're back in the land and we're rebuilding the temple. So should we be mourning over our lost temple now that we're back? And remember, their overall objective here is to gain favor in God's sight. But they tip their hand when you look at the end of their question, when they tip their heart as well, when they say, should we weep and should we abstain as I have done these 70 years? There's a bit of an emphasis here on their own merit. They're pointing to what they have done. And we need to keep that in mind as we look at God's response. So these men went to the prophets and the priests, but we notice that God responds in verse four by speaking to Zechariah himself. Reading verse four and into verse five. Then the word of Yahweh of hosts came to me saying, speak to all the people of the land and to the priests. 
And so God is saying, this message is so important. The answer to this question is so important that not only do these two men or these few men need to, need to know this, but all the people need to know this, and especially the priests. They must know the dangers of ritual worship. And God's answer to them is actually that you are full of ritual worship. And the first thing that characterizes ritual worship is that it is man-made, and we're going to see this. So in the latter part of verse 5 in chapter 7, God says to them, when you fasted and mourned in the fifth month and in the seventh month, these 70 years. So he's recognizing the fifth month. That was when Nebuchadnezzar came and burned the temple. But the seventh month, a couple of months later, what happened was they had instituted a governor and they'd put Gedaliah in place as governor over the land. But Gedaliah was murdered. And so there were two occasions for mourning. And God says, you were mourning in your fasting. And he points to what mourning is. And we need to understand what mourning is. It's a genuine sorrow over your sin. We know that. And Jesus speaks in the, the Beatitudes. He said, blessed are those who mourn. Jesus is not referring to people who mourn over some event. What they're mourning over is their own sin. And so when God is addressing mourning here, he's addressing people who need to be mourning over their sin. And to fast is to abstain from human comforts so that you can per focus on personal holiness. And God says, you did this for 70 years. And that should impress people and that should impress God, but it doesn't. Because what has happened here is that Judah has created their own worship solution rather than following God's instructions. And to see that, let's turn back to Jeremiah 29. We've been there a couple of times in the past, but it's good for us to turn back there so that we can see what God's design for them was. And as we're reading this passage, keep in mind what it was that Israel did. Israel instituted a mourning and a fast. Jeremiah 29, we're going to look at verses 10 through 13. God is speaking again to Jeremiah, and he's speaking right on the front end of the exile into Babylon. Thus says Yahweh, when 70 years have been fulfilled for Babylon, look what God says he will do. I will visit you. I will establish my good word to you to return you to this place. For I know the plans they have for you, declares Yahweh, plans for peace and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. And then in verse 12, then you will call upon me and come to me and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and you will find me when you search for me with all your heart. God's design was go to Babylon for 70 years. Be faithful in those 70 years, and then I will act at the end of those 70 years. And the way I will act is I will bring you back. But your response to me is that you call upon me and you pray to me and you seek me and you search for me with all of your heart. And so God is saying, you approach me by my design, not by your design. And this fast that you've instituted is something of your design. So the first characteristic of ritual worship is that it's man-made. But also ritual worship is insincere. And we see that as we look a little farther into verse five. God says, when you did this, when you had this mourning and this fasting, was it actually for me that you fasted? Worship should always focus on God. God is always to be the focus of our worship. And what God is doing here is he is asking a rhetorical question. He is telling Judah, that mourning that you did for 70 years, that was not an act of worship unto me. It was insincere because it was not to me. So man-made worship, insincere worship, that is ritual worship. But ritual worship is also self-serving. And we see that in verse 6. God says, and when you eat and when you drink, are you not eating for yourselves and are you not drinking for yourselves? And when God is referring to eating and drinking here, he is moving from their practice of restraint with the mourning and the fasting and he's moving the focus to their celebrations. He's not really referring to their daily meals and their daily intake of food and drink. 
What he's referring to here are the celebrations and the fasts that were instituted and reenacted once they returned into the promised land. And God is saying, when you're doing those things, the point of those things is to remember me and to remember my role in your life. When you gather for a feast that I gave you, I gave you that purpose and that task so that you would remember me. But your focus is still on yourself and your own pleasure. So ritual worship is also self-seeking. But it's also, lastly, it's forgetful. And we see that in verse 7. <clears throat> and what God does here is, is he points to the past. He points to Israel's past to help them understand just how forgetful ritual worship really is. And God asks a question. He says, are not these the words which Yahweh called out by the hand of the former prophets? Zechariah is saying, this is nothing new with me. You have not learned from your father. Yes, you went into Babylon and Babylon took away your idolatry, but it replaced it with worldliness. But you still haven't learned to worship me by the pattern that I gave you. You're no different from your fathers. And so ritual worship is all of these things, all the way from being man-made to being forgetful. It's good for us to ask ourselves a question of personal application when we think about this. And a personal application for us is to think carefully about our own corporate worship. And the personal application really means that we must prepare ourselves carefully when we come here to corporate worship. In 2007, this church was asked to change its name. And we chose the name Grace Bible Church because the only reason that any of us are here is because of God's saving grace in our life. And so everything we do here on a Sunday morning, whether it's the music that we sing or the reading of scripture or the taking of the communion at the Lord's table or our teaching or our fellowship together, all of those things must be an act of worship unto God because of what God has done for us. So what we need to take away from this section is just an honest question where we ask ourselves, when we enter this church, are we ready to worship God because of what he has done for us? So God is saying to Israel, and when Judah comes, Judah says to God, do I need to continue with my mourning and my fasting? And God says, well, no, because that only reveals that you love ritual worship. So let me show you what true worship is. And for the next few verses, from verses 8 through 10, God explains what true worship really is. And what we see here is that God is going to be addressing the outward fruit of genuine worship. For the first few verses here, God is pointing to what it looks outwardly to worship God inwardly. Starting in verse 8, we read that the word of Yahweh came. And so this tells us that this is a new subject. God says, you see the, the word then at the beginning. The word comes then. So God is turning the corner from this question and he's starting a new subject. And he says in verse 9, thus has Yahweh of hosts said. And so God is pointing to something that he shared and that he taught in the past. This is not new. It's been in front of your fathers for generations. And this is something that you should know. And that's important when we get to verses 11 through 14. But what God is going to do is he's going to give four characteristics of true worship. And there are two things that Judah must do. And there are two things that they must not do. And the first thing that they must do is they must judge with a just judgment. And we see that at the beginning of verse 9. God says, judge with true justice. And what that means is applying God's standard, not your own standard, whenever you're evaluating a person. So when you see a person and you're evaluating them in whatever it is that their activity is, your point of evaluation is God's word, not your own standard. If a person is living rightly under God's law, then treat them as God's law demands and requires. God is telling Israel, the only standard you are to use when you are evaluating a person is my standard. One of Israel's biggest problems inside of their borders, not outside of their borders, but if you just look inside of the country and saw what one of their biggest problems was, was that they failed to apply God's law in their interactions with one another. And that led to problems all across the generations. So true worship consists of true judgment. But it also consists of compassion and loving kindness. 
God says further on in verse 9, show compassion and loving kindness each to his brother. So here he's moving beyond judging. He's saying, you know, there's much more to true worship than the outward fruit of just assessing somebody rightly. What we're getting at here with loving kindness and compassion is extending your own means and doing it with gentleness and care. Loving kindness from God's end is God's faithfulness to his covenant promises. Loving kindness in man's terms is man extending his resources to help his brother who is in need. He's, so he's to express loving kindness to his brother, but he's to do it with compassion, which means he does it with gentle care. And so what this is not is throwing money at a problem or just throwing resources at a problem. What this is, is a person putting their hand to the plow and caring for their needy brother or sister in their life. The Jew was to be known as the one who gave generously of themselves with tender care. And the reason for that was because that is what God did for them. So as they treat one another that way, they are putting on display what God did for them. So these are the two things that that God says are the outward fruits of true worship. You are to judge one another rightly, and then you're to use your own means and resources to compassionately care for one another. But then God points out two things that they should not do. And the first is no oppression. There is no room to oppress the widow and the orphan and the sojourner and the afflicted. Now, if you were in Judah and you were either a widow, or you were an orphan, or you were an alien sojourning in the land, or if for whatever reason you were needy and afflicted, you were exceedingly vulnerable. And the sinful heart of the Jew was such that it would compel them to take advantage of those who were weak for their own personal gain. And God is saying, there is no place for that. And God is saying, you you should not do this, not just in a theoretical sense, because to not do that is good, but this emulates my character. God is the one who rescues those who are in dire need because of their sin before him. So when you don't oppress others, you put my character on display again. And so these appear to be things that are all external, but we know that anything that is good externally actually originates and comes from the heart. And God gets to that at the end of verse 10 where he says, there is no devising of evil. He says, do not devise of evil in your heart against one another. And by devising evil, God is speaking of evil that is done with planning and evil that is done with intentionality. And we think about that and it's normally done in our minds, but God says, do not do this in your hearts to one another. So what God is saying here is that the planning of any kind of evil actually originates in your heart. The desire for it is what compels you to actually do it in the first place. But that extends beyond the planning of the evil to the judging rightly and the loving kindness and the compassion and the not oppressing of others. God is saying all of them start within the heart. And so God is saying that any kind of right judgment, any kind of right loving kindness and compassion, any absence of oppression that's in you, And any absence of evil planning must flow from a heart that wants to worship God. So those are the signs of true worship. So a point of application for us is we need to evaluate our motives for our interactions with one another. This is very helpful for us. Make sure your interactions with one another are motivated by a heart of love, first and foremost for God and then for one another. And a good way to evaluate that is to ask yourself, When I see a brother in need and I want to reach out and help my brother in need, what is my first and primary concern? Is it to honor God and love God and love my brother? Or is it in some way that I might benefit from that? Do I I benefit in some way? Is there anything else that motivates me in that? So this is God's design. God's design is you worship me this way. You worship me by the outward manifestations of true justice, extending compassion and loving kindness. There's an absence of oppression in this country and there is no devising of evil. There are no plans for evil. And all of this is taking place because this person is worshiping God within their heart. So this is the outflow of what it really looks like. And this is God's design. And it sounds fairly simple and straightforward, but to help Judah see that this is not a slam dunk, 
God gives Judah a history lesson. We see that in verses 11 through 14, and God shows them the results of ritual worship. And as we see this passage, looking at verses 11 through 14, notice two things. One is God is speaking in the past tense here because he's making reference to the fathers. But as he speaks, notice Judah's resolve to remain in their sin. <clears throat> and once again, in verses 11 through 13, we're going to start by observing some outward characteristics. But when we get to verse 14, we'll see the punchline at the end. Starting in verse 11, speaking of the fathers, God said, they refused to give heed and they turned a stubborn shoulder and they dulled their ears from hearing. And they made their hearts diamond hard so they could not hear the law and the words which Yahweh of hosts had sent by his spirit by the hand of the former prophets. So this is what they did outwardly. And it starts in verse 11 by refusing to give heed. Now the fathers had no problem understanding God God was exceptionally clear. There was no problem in the understanding. Rather, they understood the instructions, but they rejected the instructions. That's what it means to refuse to give heed. You see the instruction, you know all about it, you know what it is, you know what it means, and you choose to reject it. But they didn't just do that. They turned a stubborn shoulder. And what's happening here is you're turning your back to somebody so that you cannot see them you're deliberately cutting them off from your sight and your consideration and your intention. What they were doing was they were treating God as if he wasn't there. So that's the second thing they did. And then they dulled their ears from hearing. So it wasn't just limited to sight. They didn't want to hear God either. They were like a child who they covered their ears so as not to hear. You've seen children do this. Those are the first three things they did. But the fourth thing they did is really, really sobering. And this is what really needs to get our attention. They actually made their own hearts diamond hard. Those are God's word. You made your hearts diamond hard. And we know that diamond is the hardest substance known to man. And the only thing that can cut a diamond is another diamond. God is telling them this is not a matter of just not seeing and not hearing. What God is saying is there is nobody who is less soft and less receptive to my law and my truth than your fathers. You could not be more or less responsive to the gospel and the truth than the fathers. So then God explains what happens next, and this is where we need to be sobered. God says, therefore, great wrath came from Yahweh of hosts, and it happened that just as he called, and they would not listen, so they called, and I would not listen, said Yahweh of hosts. So great wrath came from Yahweh, and we know what that is. Nebuchadnezzar arrived, and he burned Jerusalem, and he destroyed the temple and took them into exile. That was God's wrath. And then God said, I would not listen. Israel calls out to God, and in the same way that Israel did not listen when God spoke to them, God refused to listen when Israel called to them. And this is not gamesmanship on God's part. This is not turnabout is fair play on God's part. That's not what he's doing here. What God is saying is that he is showing Israel the emptiness of their spiritual worship. God is saying that you will call out to me and your rebellion against me and your refusal to worship me rightly has led you to a lack of relationship with me. And so God says in verse 14, I scattered them. God did exactly what he said he would do way back in Deuteronomy 28. He scattered them. God had a perfect plan for Israel. He said, my plan for you is that you would display my character to all of the nations around you. And you would do that by observing the perfect law that I gave you. And Judah said, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to turn away from you. I'm going to refuse to give heed. I'm going to turn my back to you. I'm not going to listen to you. I'm going to harden my heart. And verse 14 shows us what their sin got them. And this is what Zechariah wants his generation to see and understand. Thus the land is desolated behind them, for they made the, the pleasant land desolate. God is saying, you are scattered and your land is desolate. Everything that I gave you to fulfill my promise to you is gone. You have nothing. And so the moral here 
is that empty worship produces an empty life. And so that's the bad news. That's the bad news of, and the results of ritual worship. But what God does in chapter 8 is he explains what happens when he is at the center of true worship. And so God gives Israel a preview of perfect worship. And that's what chapter 8 is all about. And God wants the Jew to know what is in store for them. And what's in store for them is a worship experience that is more fantastic than anything they ever had that was better than the first day that they commemorated the temple. It's better than anything they could ever imagine. But he begins by reminding them in the first few verses of chapter 8 that it all starts with him. And notice in this chapter, if you just look down, how many times you see the phrase, thus says Yahweh of hosts. I think it's about 10 times when you see it. You'll see it all the way through the chapter. It's right at the beginning of just about all of these verses. And what has happened here, and God knows that up to that point, and it's true up until today, that man has filled the world with his own idea of worship. Take any belief system in the world throughout all of human history, and man has designed for himself what he believes to be right worship. And what God is saying is, I am going to give you authoritative truth on what perfect worship really entails. And the first thing that's true about it, and we're going to see it in the first eight verses, is that it requires a divine enabling. And so perfect worship demands a number of things. And the first thing that it requires, actually, and we see it right out of the gate, is God's possession. God is saying, true worshipers belong to me. God says, I am jealous with a great jealousy for Zion, and with great wrath, I am jealous for her. There's two kinds of jealousy. There's a sinful jealousy, and there's a biblical God-honoring jealousy. Sinful jealousy is when you have a strong desire for what rightfully belongs to somebody else. But biblical God-honoring jealousy is when you have a strong desire for what rightfully belongs to you. It is right for a husband to, to desire his wife because she rightfully belongs to him. It is right for a wife to desire her husband because he rightly belongs to her. And God is saying that anybody, Jew or Gentile, who is participating in true, biblical, perfect worship will belong to me and I will make you my possession. I am so jealous for you that I will do that with great wrath. So perfect worship involves God's possession of those people, but it also involves God's presence. And we see that in verse three. God says, I will return to Zion and I will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem and Jerusalem will be called the city of truth. Perfect worship is going to involve proximity to God himself. And the result of that proximity is that truth will prevail and truth will pervade. Where God is will be known as a place of truth. So perfect worship involves God's presence, but it also involves God's peace. And you see that in verse four, you have old men and women sitting in the streets and you have children playing in the streets because Israel is God's own possession and he's among them. There will be peace in that place. And that is the exact opposite of what you have today. That's the exact opposite of what has been in place for centuries and millennia in Israel and what is the case today. You have Hamas in the, in the Gaza Strip in the south. You have Hezbollah in Lebanon in the north. There is no peace there whatsoever. There has been a mandatory period of military service in Israel for everybody over the age of 18 for many, many, many years. There has been an absence of peace. And God is saying, perfect worship will put an end to all of that. And then he says that perfect worship is also going to demand my power. This is something that when people look at this and they see a peace that's there and a presence that's there, people say, well, there's nothing we can do to bring that about. But God says, will it be too difficult in my sight? We take this for granted in our country. And a lasting peace like that is unheard of in Israel. We don't have any conflict in our soil and our land up to this point. None of us in our lifetime have really experienced much trouble that way. But this was unheard of in Israel. But God is saying, in my sight, I will do this by my means and my power. I will bring this about. Because God's power is a power of a different kind 
It is a power that is sufficient to establish and to maintain peace. So perfect worship is going to require God's power to sustain it. And lastly, it requires God's rescue. You have these people who are going to be worshiping God perfectly, but presently they're not actually in that location where they're going to worship him, where he is. And so God addresses that in verses 7 and 8. And he says, I am going to save my people from the land where the sun rises and where the sun sets, and I will bring them back. And we need to get this. What this really is here is a wholesale relocation of the Jewish people. This is not a rescue of a few Jews from one place and bringing them back. This is a relocation of Jews that are dispersed throughout the world and they will all be returned to the promised land, to Jerusalem where they will worship God. This is what God does. Faithful worship is always enabled. It's always established by God. So this is perfect worship and it will take place in the future in the millennial kingdom But Judah in Zechariah's time needs to understand something. They need to understand that they they should not sit by passively and wait for this. God demanded something of them. He demands a diligent or a present diligence today. And we see that in verses 9 through 17. And what God is saying here is live today with kingdom realities in view. And the first thing God says is be strong in doing my work. We see that in verse 9. Let your hands be strong to the end that the temple might be built. Those who will worship perfectly in the future are active in their worship today. So finish building the temple. You're halfway through this, finish the job. But don't just do it under your own strength. You must do it by relying on my grace. And you see that in verse 10. God says, and what God does is he points back to when they started working on this. He's pointing back to the period of time where they were just beginning to lay the foundation. And God says, at that time, there was no wage for man. There was no peace because of the adversary. God is telling them, you started the rebuild under very, very, very difficult circumstances. But God says, there will be peace for the seed and the vine will yield its fruit and the land will yield its produce. God is telling them, I will be your provision as you continue. When you plant a seed, that seed will grow to maturity and you will harvest it. And the vine and the land will yield their bounty and I will provide the rain. This was really great for Israel because this was not happening up to this point. God is saying, I will be your immediate provision. And then notice in verse 12, he says, I will cause the remnant of these people to inherit all of these things. Now, what happened in the past in Israel's history was whenever God would discipline them by bringing another nation into them to besiege them and oppress them, the first thing they would do is that besieging nation would eat their crops, would take their crops and destroy them or eat them. And God is saying, nobody will steal those crops. I will preserve them for you. And all of this comes from me. So you've got to rely on my grace, but you also need to rely on my promises. And we see that in verses 14 and 15. God says, just as I purposed to bring about evil to you, so I have again purposed in these days to do good. Do not fear. God is saying, I was faithful in the past. I told you that I would punish you if you disobeyed me. And God was faithful and he did that. But he's saying, so also... I will be faithful to my word to bless you. And then he adds, do not fear. Because things look pretty grim at this point. They're halfway through rebuilding the temple, but they're not finished. None of these things that God has said will come to pass have actually come to pass yet. But God says, believe in my promises for your future. Do not fear. My promises are trustworthy. You can believe them. And then the last thing they need to do is they need to rely on God's truth. We see that in verses 16 and 17. These are the things which you should do. Speak the truth to one another. Judge with truth and judgment for peace in your gates. And also let none of you devise evil in your heart against one another. And do not love false oaths. For these are what I hate, declares Yahweh. Judah was to speak the truth. They were to judge with truth, not with partiality or preference. God addressed that earlier. They were not to devise evil and love false oaths. They were not to do that. 
God says, I will be your God in truth and righteousness, so you must love truth. So God has told them that the millennial kingdom will be characterized by truth, so they are to strive for that same truth today. And this is not just a mechanical truth-telling and judging. Again, this is something that needs to originate from their heart. So God is saying, love truth at a heart level. You cannot love the truth unless you love the God of the truth. So true worship is going to involve you loving the God of truth that enables you to speak the truth. So in summary, God is saying, do my work today by relying on my grace and my promises and my truth. And then what God does in the last few verses of this section, this is so helpful for us, is he gives them a picture of an unprecedented reversal. He's saying, this is what it's actually going to look like in the millennial kingdom when you worship me. And the first thing we're going to see there in verses 18 and 19 relates to a Jewish feasting. Not a Jewish fasting, but a Jewish feasting. Verses 18 and 19. Then the word of Yahweh of hosts came to me saying, thus says Yahweh of hosts, the fast of the fourth, the fast of the fifth, the fast of the seventh, and the fast of the tenth month will become joy, gladness, and merry appointed feast for the house of Judah. So love, truth, and peace. Now, when the story started, they came and they were asking about the fifth month. But God mentions three more months here. In the fourth month, Nebuchadnezzar actually conquered Jerusalem. It was the fifth month when he burned the temple. And it was the seventh month when Gedaliah was killed. And he mentions the tenth month because the year before, that was when the siege began. And so God was saying, all of those mornings, all of your grief over that, whether it's biblical or not, that is going to be changed. That's going to become something else. And what it's going to become is gladness and joy and appointed feasts. And what this tells us is that this is going to be an ongoing, perpetual celebration. God is helping Israel understand that this is something that is going to be characteristic of you in the new kingdom, in the millennial kingdom. This will be a perpetual worship and a perpetual feast. And when God says become, He doesn't say this is going to be added on to all of your mourning. God is saying this is going to replace. This is going to override all of that mourning. So the Jewish fasting will turn into Jewish feasting. And we ask ourselves, well, why would that be? And the answer is because in the same way that God was faithful to judge, he will also be faithful to bless. So for the Jew who has only known hardship and difficulty and oppression, This truly was unprecedented. There is going to be a time when you're not looking over your shoulder. You're not worrying. There's peace and there's joy and there's feasting and ongoing. So there's going to be an ongoing feasting. But there will also be a Gentile entreaty to God. Remember at the end of this age, up until the very end of the tribulation, every single nation will love Babylon and hate God. And they'll be fully deceived by the Antichrist in everything that they do. So there's going to be all of this oppression against God. But here you see the reversal in verse 21. The inhabitants of one city are going to go to the inhabitants of another saying, let us go at once. There is going to be an urgency here. You see this in verse 22. Many peoples and many nations will come to seek Yahweh. So every single nation in the world that is going to be aligned against Christ, against Israel, against Jerusalem, they will be coming to seek Yahweh and be coming to entreat his favor. And they're going to be acknowledging the one true God. And this worship will be so perfect that the ones who formerly hated God will come to God and they will seek his favor. All of that will be motivated by the perfect worship of the Jew And the world has never seen such a thing as that to this point. So there's going to be Gentiles entreating God. But there are also going to be Gentiles who are honoring the Jew. And we see that in the very last verse of this passage. God writes, In those days, ten men from every tongue of the nations will take hold of the garment of the Jew. And they will say, Let us go with you. For we have heard that God is with you. And God is speaking again of the millennial kingdom. We see that when he says, in those days. 
And in, in that time, again, remember, not only will those nations hate God, but they will hate and they will mistreat and they will ridicule the Jew precisely because they are the people of God. And so perfect worship will cause these same Gentiles to honor the Jew, and they're going to do it by grabbing the garment of the Jew. Now, this is exactly what King Saul did to Samuel in 1 Kings 15, when Samuel went to Saul and he rebuked him for not completely destroying the Amalekites as God had instructed them to do. And what this is, is a gesture that prevails upon another because that other one has a true relationship with God. Saul was acknowledging that Samuel had the right relationship with God and he grabbed the garment. In the same way, that's what 10 Gentiles are gonna do when they see the Jew. Take us to your God. So the perfect worship will cause the Jew to be honored as the people who worship the one true God. So that is the perfect worship, and it will be in the millennial kingdom. So we've been talking about Israel. We've been talking about Judah. We've been talking about God's promise to them for the millennial kingdom. So we have to ask ourselves, how does that relate to us today? So what I want us to do is I want us to turn to our New Testaments, to John chapter 4. Turn to verse 23. 23. These are Jesus' words. <clears throat> Jesus is speaking with the woman at the well, and she has not yet been enlightened as to the true gospel. These are Jesus' words. Jesus says, an hour is coming, and then he says, and it now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. Jesus is speaking of today. He's speaking of the church age, the age that we live in. True worship does happen today, but it's only by people who worship in spirit and in truth. And by spirit here, this is not a reference to the Holy Spirit. This is Jesus saying, true worship comes not from outward appearance and not with ritual worship, but it's from a genuine affection of the heart. It's a humble, reverent, disposition towards the God who would reconcile you to himself. So you worship in spirit with humility because God has reconciled you to himself, but you worship in truth that that reconciling only happened through faith and submission to the Lordship of Jesus Christ in your life. So the perfect worship that is coming for the Jew in the millennial kingdom and every other believer in the millennial kingdom is available to us today when we worship in spirit and in truth. Let's pray. Father God, I praise you and I thank you for this day. I praise you and thank you for this passage that you have given it to us, that you have shown us that you are not interested in outward worship. You are not interested in ritual worship. God, you are interested in worship that comes from the heart. I pray for us as a church that you would grant us your grace to worship you rightly in all that we do. Lord, when we are gathered here collectively or when we fellowship with one another, when we serve one another, when we read our Bibles, when we live out our marriages, God, grant us the grace to do it in a way that is pleasing to you. I pray it in Christ's name. Amen.